Hi everyone. We're back with lectures 19 and 20 on the Cold War. Before we begin, we need to get a working definition of what is a Cold War. Generally speaking, this refers to a period of rising tensions between the United States on one side and the USSR or the Soviet Union on the other side. All this after World War II. Why would these two countries that had worked together to achieve victory for the Allied cause in World War II suddenly turn on one another after the war had concluded? We're going to talk about some of those reasons as we move forward with the lecture today. However, we still need to define what a Cold War is. A hot war would be something very obvious where both sides are firing on one another, such as uh, a hot war was World War II, where you have Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan fighting against the Allied powers. A Cold War, in contrast, is a war in which you don't have two major superpowers, in this case the United States on one side and the Soviet Union on the other, fighting one another. They will never be directly firing upon one another. There will be plenty of violence associated with this Cold War, but it will never be uh, the United States directly launching an attack on the Soviet Union or vice versa. But let's be clear, there is death and destruction associated with the Cold War. We will see that both sides will support a series of proxy wars to try and advance their interest globally. A proxy war is one in which a power does not fight directly, but they fight indirectly against an enemy. So a proxy is a stand-in. For example, uh, in the Korean War, which we'll be discussing as we move forward, while U.S. troops will be on the ground in Korea, we will see that the Soviet Union will not have troops on the other side of the firing line. Instead, the Soviet Union will support North Korea by funneling arms and expertise to them so that they can fight U.S. troops. The Vietnam War will also be another of the proxy wars that will result in tremendous amounts of devastation and loss. In the case of the war in Vietnam, the United States will become directly involved, but once more, they are never firing upon Soviet soldiers. They are never firing directly on Chinese soldiers. Uh, instead, we will see that China and the USSR will support uh, the North Vietnamese cause. They will send uh, shipments of arms and help train soldiers in that way. So, if the United States and its allies have such a grudge match going on during this Cold War against the Soviet Union and its allies, then why don't these two powers just slug it out? directly rather than fighting through client states or through these so-called proxy wars. The answer is simple. By 1949, the Soviet Union will also develop nuclear weapons technology. When that happens, the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union on its side with its allies will have access to the same weapons of mass destruction. Uh, meaning that their nuclear arsenals will grow in the coming decades. So for a war on the ground to begin between the United States and the Soviet Union, it would not stay a small localized conflict for very long. Instead, both sides have access to these devastating weapons of destruction, and it would very quickly escalate into an event of global destruction. In other words, you know, within a few decades of uh, both sides developing nuclear weapons, they have massive stockpiles of these uh, long-range ballistic missiles. And what would ensue if something popped off between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies, it would it would come to eclipse any other world war in the scope and scale of devastation and human loss. It would be a war in which there would be no survivors on either side of the equation. And what I'm referring to here is the concept of MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. This is what really underlies the Cold War. Since both sides can mutually annihilate one another with their nuclear arsenals, 
uh, this means that you can't have any direct conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union because it, it would only take the slightest provocation for people to, to hit those buttons on both sides, the missiles fly through the air, and the world is over as we know it. That doesn't mean, however, that both sides don't want to advance their interest globally. And so if they can't directly confront one another, then here's where they use client states. Here's where they support proxy wars in which they try to uh, gain influence and power abroad, but they are trying to distance themselves a little bit from it. Now would be a good time to talk about, well, what went wrong? between the United States and the USSR after World War II. There's been books written on this subject, so um, suffice it to say, uh, this is condensed. But we'll start with a simple change in leadership in Washington, D.C. after the death of President Franklin D. Roosevelt in early 1945. FDR had understood uh, in working with Joseph Stalin, the Soviet premier, that um, Stalin was a very paranoid figure to begin with. He was also someone that had shown a willingness to slaughter millions of his own citizens should they not fall into line. So President Roosevelt had always sort of tried to work with Stalin as best he could and uh, tried to earn the trust of Stalin. The new president of the United States by 1945, however, is Harry Truman, and he's a very different sort of personality. His no-nonsense, Midwestern, terse style of communication began to really sort of grate on Joseph Stalin. While FDR liked to joke around a lot and, you know, he, he sort of teased Stalin by calling him Uncle Joe, Truman was brusque. Uh, he did not mince words. He did not play nice. Two of his favorite sayings sum up his attitude. He was fond of saying, the buck stops here, and if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So Stalin is already, as I said, a man that does not trust anyone. And with this change in leadership in Washington, D.C., this further strains the relationship between these two countries. Stalin was also very much alarmed at the United States' possession in 1945 of a weapon that it did not have, meaning atomic weapons that were deployed over Hiroshima and Nagasaki to finally bring an end to the war in the Pacific. While publicly Stalin supported the U.S. and its use of the bomb, privately he started freaking out, uh, reportedly ordering a crash program to accelerate the USSR's development of atomic weapons of their own, telling Soviet scientists, quote, the equilibrium has been destroyed. Provide the bomb. It will remove a great danger from us. Understand that underlying uh, some of these tensions between the clashing personalities of Truman and Stalin is kind of an ongoing ideological debate between the two areas, meaning that that the West and its capitalist systems were anathema. They, they were not viewed in a positive light by the Soviet Union, which had undergone a communist revolution. What this means is both sides are trying to advance their particular ideology, capitalism on one side, communism on the other, and uh, that this also is a major driver of some of these uh, accelerating tensions during the period. Other tensions will arise over the fate of Eastern Europe after the war. Remember, at the Yalta Conference, Stalin had agreed to the principle of self-determination for many countries in Eastern Europe. As his fears over the U.S.'s possession of nuclear weapons grew, he will end up violating the promise that he made at the Yalta Conference. You can see the map here on the slide of the so-called Eastern Bloc members. Understand that when the Soviet Union comes into these regions, that they are not allowing uh, fair and free and open elections. In Poland, for example, the Soviet-controlled government would allow no elections at the end of World War II. In border nations, many were forced into establishing communist governments, such as Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Why is the USSR doing this, though? 
they are fearful of U.S. presence, especially in Western Europe, and they were af afraid of so-called capitalist encirclement. Uh, they also want to use these as buffer states so that in the event that there was another war that erupted on the continent of Europe, you would now have to get through Soviet-controlled Czechoslovakia or Poland, for example, before your troops would actually get onto home soil for the Soviet Union. Needless to say, this is only inflaming tensions between the Soviet Union and many Western powers. How to deal with these rising tensions? We will see the creation of a new diplomatic body known as the United Nations after World War II. One of the chief failings of the League of Nations uh, was that it had basically been forced to stand idly by while Adolf Hitler chewed up much of Europe and Japan took over much of the Pacific in the 1930s. The League of Nations, uh, in other words, had had no enforcement mechanism, no way for those nations who were members to vote on the use of force to stop rogue nations from becoming aggressive. So a key difference that we will see with the United Nations is that it will allow its members to vote on the use of armed force and to act upon that to create a multinational military force to go in and stop genocides in other countries or stop uh, the rise of dictatorships. The enforcement mechanism for the United Nations will be the Security Council. Another big difference between the League of Nations after World War I and the United Nations, which will come into being after World War II, is that the United States will be a member from the get-go. The Soviet Union will be a member from its very inception. This lends uh, credibility to this new diplomatic body, a credibility that the League of Nations just never enjoyed. I want you to understand though that it's not just the United States that's worried about rising Soviet influence abroad. In particular, we're going to see that Great Britain will become one of the staunchest allies of the United States in this so-called Cold War period. So for Winston Churchill, who had been Prime Minister during wartime of Great Britain, after the war, he too is looking on uh, in a concerned fashion at the buildup of Soviet influence, especially in Eastern Europe. He will deliver his so-called Iron Curtain speech in March of 1946. And the Iron Curtain was not a literal curtain made out of metal, uh, but it was meant to be symbolic, as you can see from the excerpt from the speech that I have here on the slide. Um, it's as if, in those areas that are now under Soviet control, he said, it's as if an Iron Curtain has descended across Eastern Europe, choking it off from the rest of the world, and that all of these uh, Soviet-dominated countries, these Soviet satellite states, were subject to... Uh, complete domination by the USSR. He will go on to argue that, you know, just ignoring the problem will not work, that appeasement will not work. Churchill had been a long vocal critic of the policy of appeasement. He said it didn't work in World War II. It's not going to work now with the buildup of Soviet power. Uh, instead, he argued, and many Western allies, included the United States, agreed, that what was needed was a show of strength to counterbalance rising Soviet influence. President Truman agreed, and we will see in 1946 and 1947 the so-called Truman Doctrine. President Truman will now make the statement that the United States had security interests not just in the Western Hemisphere, but globally. And he will commit the United States, um, will commit funding will commit the training of troops, whatever was needed to stop the spread of communism abroad to any country in the world that needed it. In other words, um, for Truman and many of his advisors, they considered communism almost like a, a virulent disease that needed to be quarantined or contained. So you need to be familiar with this concept of containment, what will later be dubbed the domino effect. But the idea behind containment is, is if you stop communism quickly and don't allow it to spread, almost like cancer, to neighboring countries, then, then you can keep it contained and it may not gain in power over time. Or like a domino, if you have a, a row of dominoes, if you set the first one in motion, 
that the uh, the next one is likely to fall and the next one and the next one. The key is with this notion of containment or the domino effect is to get in as quickly as possible when you see communism spreading abroad and support those countries nearby so that it does not enlarge, that that, that doctrine does not spread over time. To this end, the CIA will be created in 1947 specifically for this purpose, to gather information on potential communist plots abroad and to t undertake covert activities to stop its spread. We'll talk more about the domestic aspect of the Truman Doctrine in Part 2 of this lecture.